Welcome back, mitochondriax, to another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. So I am altering course a tiny bit because I was planning on hitting the glycolysis and glucose inhibitors next, but I did a poll of all of you, and as of right now, glutamine inhibitors, Don and others, are winning by 42%. And the closest second would be ivermectin at 23%, benbendazole, menbendazole at 22%, medicinal mushrooms at 7%. And what my plan was of glucose inhibitors is at 6%. So I did alter course here and I'm going to listen to you all of what you guys want to hear. So I'm going to focus the next several videos. I basically created a micro series on glutamine inhibition. And I'm going to talk about as many of the known both uptake inhibitors and glutamine utilization inhibitors as I could find in the literature. And unfortunately, many of the glutamine inhibitors are strictly research chemicals that no one will likely ever have access to at the bedside. But some of them are available and some of them I'm sure you have heard about in the past. So let's get into it. I'm going to remind everyone that although aerobic glycolysis the Warburg effect utilizes glucose 10 to 30 times more than a normal cell. It also utilizes glutamine 10 to 30 times more than a normal cell as well. And that is part of this whole idea of metabolic reprogramming. And this paper is called Glutamine Reliance in Cell Metabolism. In this review, we introduced the various biosynthetic and bioenergetic roles of glutamine based on the compartmentalization of glutamine metabolism to explain why cells exhibit metabolic reliance on glutamine. Additionally, we examine whether glutamine derivatives contribute to epigenetic regulation associated with tumor genesis. And as we can see here in normal cell physiology, you have some amount of glucose going into the TCA cycle, some amount of glutamine. But during the metabolic reprogramming process, you have a bunch more glucose being utilized, it's not getting into the TCA cycle like it's supposed to. It's actually forming lactate. And then glutamine is picking up the slack for some of the TCA function as well as being utilized to help build glutathione to manage redox chemistry and for biosynthetic pathways such as nucleotides and fatty acid synthesis, as well as synthesis of other amino acids. And we see here that glutamine is deaminated and this ammonia that is left over is also driving Warburg metabolism because the excess ammonia will stimulate PDK and that will feed back on pyruvate dehydrogenase complex similar to what HIF does. So the excess ammonia is also part of the issue with glutaminolysis. So this paper is titled Metabolic Reprogramming Cancer Unraveling the Role of Glutamine in Tumor Genesis. And it says that increased glutaminolysis is now recognized as a key feature of the metabolic profile of cancer cells, along with increased aerobic glycolysis, the Warburg effect. In this review, we discuss the roles of glutamine in contributing to the core metabolism of proliferating cells by supporting energy production and biosynthesis. And then this paper is titled Glutaminolysis, a hallmark of cancer metabolism. Glutamine is the most abundant circulating amino acid in blood and muscle, and it is critical for many fundamental cell functions in cancer cells, including synthesis of metabolites that maintain mitochondrial metabolism, generation of antioxidants to remove reactive oxygen species, synthesis of non-essential amino acids, purines, pyrimidines, and fatty acids for cellular replication and activation of cell signaling. So it is highly important for cancer cells to have an abundant amount of glutamine in their system because it is doing multiple pathogenic tasks to maintain itself, not only replication, but to protect itself against oxidative stress. So despite remarkable heterogeneity in cancer's metabolism, certain characteristics such as increased glucose and glutamine consumption are broadly conserved, a phenomenon that indicates fundamental biochemical necessities that is exploited for clinical imaging of tumors and labeled metabolite analogs. So essentially what they're saying is, is something that we have discussed at length is that even though many different types of cancer cells originate from different types of tissues and they can have a variety of different genetic abnormalities and phenotypic expressions of those genetic abnormalities, there is this common ground among cancer that is well-conserved no matter what type of cancer it is, and that is this hyper-reliance on glucose and glutamine. And that is what metabolic therapy aims to achieve, is to cut off that conserved biochemical mechanism. We have seen this slide before, and this is basically showing how 
hypoxia inducible factor one alpha and two alpha are the major node responsible for the upregulation of transporters that are responsible for glucose uptake, responsible for upregulation of glycolytic enzymes that help break down glucose, upregulation of lactate dehydrogenase enzymes to help further convert pyruvate to lactate, and then transporters for glutamine and glutamine utilization enzymes. That I think we have covered at length. What we have not covered that much are other things that are associated with the Warburg effect and in particular glutamine. And that is things that you may or may not have heard about, things like KRAS and MYC. These are different signaling cascades that also have an effect on the glutamine metabolism apparently seen in cancer. And another thing that we have not talked about in great detail is how glutamine is utilized by cancer cells. And it was alluded to in that paper, but it's about the synthesis of other amino acids and nucleotides for DNA replication, as well as partially being responsible for the creation of the excess glutathione needed to deal with oxidative stress and to make cells resistant against oxidative therapies. So we can see that shutting down glutamine is a major goal for the metabolic treatment of cancer, but it's not as straightforward as shutting down glucose. Unfortunately, glutamine deprivation can actually cause harm. And that's where this part of the equation becomes more nuanced because although the vernacular that glutamine is not an essential amino acid does not mean it's not critically important. It just means that we can make our own glutamine from other amino acids and from other substrates. So we don't necessarily have to take it in from the diet because a lot of people will ask, well, what kind of diet can I be on to restrict glutamine? And the answer is you really can't. A therapeutic ketogenic diet is going to be fairly low in protein. It's going to have about five to max 10% of your calories from protein, but you can still synthesize glutamine utilizing other amino acids and other substrates. So that makes it quote unquote, non-essential means you don't have to take it in from the diet, but it's critical for many functions. So one of those important functions is the immune response. And as it says here in this paper, a glutamine tug of war between cancer and immune cells, recent advances in the unraveling of the ongoing battle. And it says cancer cells heavily rely on glutamine as a critical nutrient for survival and proliferation, while immune cells require glutamine for activation and proliferation during immune reactions. This metabolic competition creates a dynamic tug of war between cancer cells and immune cells. Targeting glutamine transporters and downstream enzymes involved in glutamine metabolism holds significant promise for anti-tumor immunity. So there's a big concern and a more of a nuanced approach that you have to take with glutamine. And this is where the research is still ongoing and needs a lot of work. But the bottom line is protocols are trying to be developed where you can starve cancer of the glutamine that it needs while still not depriving the immune system of the glutamine that it needs. And that is a much more difficult job to accomplish. And that could mean something as Dr. Seafried has proposed, which is the press pulse, where you're pressing down glucose continuously, but you're pulsing in glutamine inhibitors to where you're just kind of knocking down cancer every time you pulse. And then during the off phases of the press pulse, you would allow the immune system to obtain the resources that needs to be able to function adequately. This is still an area of unsettled science, to say the least. But interestingly enough, in this paper, enhancing the efficiency of glutamine metabolism inhibitors in cancer therapy. And it says, recent research has yielded important insights into the mechanisms that determine the tumor and the host immune responses to pharmacological perturbations of glutamine metabolism. Here we discuss these findings and suggest that collectively they point towards patient stratification and drug combination strategies to maximize efficacy of glutamine metabolism inhibitors as cancer therapeutics. And what it said, ultimately in the conclusions is that instead glutamine addiction and cellular dependence on glutamine metabolizing enzymes show a robust pan-cancer correlation with the increased glutamate glutathione demand that follow activation of the cellular antioxidant response program. Essentially what they're showing is that one of the major reasons why cancer relies on glutamine is actually to increase their ability to produce glutathione that allows them to have a robust antioxidant response system. And it says collectively work suggests that oxidative stress is a conserved biomarker for tumor dependence on glutamine. And tumors with genetic or pharmacologic addiction 
to the NRF2 antioxidant response pathway are best candidates for treatment with glutamine inhibitors. Supporting this idea, preclinical studies have shown that CB839 treatment synergizes potentially with radiation therapy and drugs that induce redox stress, drugs that basically produce excess oxidative stress. That would include things like certain chemotherapeutics, but IV vitamin C, hyperbaric oxygen, and radiation therapy. And it says a parallel approach to improve the efficacy of glutamine metabolism inhibitors is to harness their surprising enhancement of anti-cancer immunity. So essentially what research is starting to uncover is that although there is this tug of war between immune cells and cancer cells for the supply of glutamine, and that potentially long-term deprivation of glutamine could likely be detrimental to the human organism for a variety of reasons, immunity being one of those things, it was showing that there's actually kind of a paradoxical enhancement of anti-cancer activity and immunity that happens when glutamine inhibitors are used in some patients, which is pretty fascinating. So this idea of blocking glutamine as an anti-metabolite and the whole class of anti-metabolite chemotherapeutics has been going on for a long, long time. As a matter of fact, the ones that most of us are even aware of due to Dr. Seafried's awareness campaign is Dawn. And Dawn was discovered in the 50s and has been studied ever since. Some of the other ones that are on this list that are still utilizing research chemical names are not so well known and have been discovered as late as 2018. So ongoing research and drug discovery in this area is still happening. And this paper is titled, Exploiting the Achilles Heel of Cancer, Disrupting Glutamine Metabolism for Effective Cancer Treatment. It says, in this review, we summarize the significant role of glutamine metabolism in tumor development and highlight the vulnerabilities of targeting glutamine metabolism for effective therapy. In particular, we review the reported drugs targeting glutaminase and glutamine uptake for efficient cancer treatment. So I'm not going to go over every single one of these. If you want to download this paper, it will have it in there, an even more exhausting table than this. But it basically shows all of the known pharmacologic agents that are used and at least one non-pharmacologic agent used for the inhibition of glutamine. And it talks about its level of toxicity. It talks about its absorption. It talks about some of the trials that have been done and gives the research papers and references that are in relation to whatever these compounds are. I found some diagrams that I think would be a little more helpful in explaining how these things are proposed to work. So there are some major mechanisms that are utilized within glutamine metabolism, and that is glutamine uptake. Essentially, how does glutamine get from systemic circulation into cells, right? It's going to be uptaked into the cells. And there are several different transporters that are used. For example, this SLC1A5 or this SLC7A11. And these have several different agents that are known to affect these various transporters. Then once we get inside the actual cell, there are a variety of enzymes, glutaminase and other glutamine enzymes that are converting glutamine to glutamate, glutamate to alpha ketoglutarate, and several of the medications and supplements that have been proposed are shown here and in which enzymes they block respectively. Don, for example, blocks this glutaminase pathway. EGCG, for example, blocks this pathway and so on and so forth. So this paper is titled Therapeutic Targeting Glutaminolysis as a Novel Strategy to combat cancer stem cells. And it says that research is increasingly focused on glutamine catabolism in their attempt to discover an effective therapy for cancer stem cells. Targeting catalytic enzymes in glutaminolysis, such as glutaminase, GLS, is achievable with small molecule inhibitors, some of which are in early phase clinical trials and have promising safety profiles. And this is just a really nice picture because it's showing kind of not only some of the inhibitors, such as Dawn, such as azacerine, such as some of these other compounds and where they act upon in the cellular milieu, but it also shows the epigenetic phenomenons and genetic alterations that are seen within cancers that are driving this process. So for example, MYC and KRAS are positively upregulating the glutamine metabolism. And you can see here that glutamine is being converted with the use of cysteine to make glutathione and help deal with excess reactive oxygen species, which helps protect the cancer cells from oxidative therapies as well. And it says here that cancer stem cells are dependent on glucose, glutamine, and a variety of other substrates to a greater extent than their non-cancerous counterparts. Combination therapy is by far the most successful form of cancer treatment due to the fact that it inhibits multiple 
separate pathways at once, reducing the possibility of the creation of cancer cells that are resistant to treatment. This is very similar how we treat certain pathologic conditions such as HIV, such as tuberculosis. We use drug cocktails in a way that overwhelm the virus or bacteria that allow drug resistance to be minimized. And I hope that I'm making the case that metabolic therapy is not a magic pill solution. It will never be a magic pill solution. It will never be a silver bullet. It will have to be used in combination. And the foundation of that combination is going to be a therapeutic, calorie-restricted, in the right cases, ketogenic diet, fasting, and the utilization of exogenous ketones. That is the foundation. Then you can build on top of that foundation. And one of the most important things to build upon, apart from the decrease in serum glucose, intracellular uptake and utilization of glucose, is the intracellular uptake of glutamine and glutamine utilization by some of these potential agents. And ultimately what I'm going to be doing in the next several videos is I'm going to be picking apart as many of these agents as I can, and I'm going to be showing them where they act on the cell and showing literature to suggest that these agents could be effective strategies in the future to use in combination with other metabolic therapies as a way to manage and treat cancer from a mitochondrial metabolic perspective. I hope that the last couple of videos have allowed you to have a moment where you are connecting the dots that we have laid down months ago, talking about the metabolism of cancer, how it differs from normal metabolism, how it relies on glucose and glutamine, how the tumor microenvironment and the acidification by lactic acidosis will contribute to that, and how each one of the nodes that are driving these processes are going to be our therapeutic targets for employing metabolic therapy. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me. If you have anything you want to share with your fellow mitochondriacs, please leave comments. If you like the videos, please like it. If you have people that in your life that could be benefiting from this type of information, please share it with them. And until next time.